Because indoor rowing is totally like rowing on the water, right? Do you hear the sarcasm in my voice? It is not the same. (laughs) The simulation is not like the real thing, folks. Well, at least not in the beginning. When you get better and you are rowing at higher pressure, it does feel similar. But at the beginning, it is not the same at all. So the thing that I thought would be helpful actually put me at a disadvantage. Welcome to You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. You are ambitious in life and in your career, but something is missing. You want to bring more of your passion to what you do, because let's be honest, you pour a ton into your work and it needs to mean more. I'm your host, Laura Eigel. I'm a mom, wife, PhD, coach, advocate, introvert, and indoor rowing fanatic. I'm passionate about living a life that's in line with my values. We'll give you the actionable tips and tools you need to lead with your values, make a difference, and have career success. The world needs more diversity and authenticity in the top jobs at organizations. Your leadership belongs there. You belong in the C-suite. What gets you up in the morning? What drives your decisions? What do you stand for? No idea, not even sure where to start. I use my values to guide my life and career. It's the basis of how I've built boundaries for myself and stuck to them. Are you ready to dig into what matters to you? Go to thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet. That's thecatchgroup.com to download your free values worksheet to get to your core values and take action on what matters most. Welcome to this week's episode of the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. In the intro of this podcast, you have heard me say it for three seasons, and that's over 130 episodes, that I am an indoor rowing fanatic. If you follow me on social media or get my newsletters, you may know that now I'm not just an indoor rowing fanatic, but I've now extended my enthusiasm to on the water rowing. Yes, I have now been in a boat. So I wanted to do a solo episode about my recent experience in getting out on the water and rowing because there are so many relatable lessons that I've had for life and leadership. So I will say I am still early on into the rowing on the actual water journey. I wanted to share a few insights so far, but I will say that I am still new. I am still a beginner. I've learned a ton of new concepts and new terminology, and I will be the first to tell you that I am not an expert. So when I mess up, please know that I'm doing my very best. And if there are any seasoned rowers out there, please know that I'm trying my best and I'm sharing some insights that pertain to my journey, my personal growth, and also to leadership and teams. But first, let's back up a bit. I first got into indoor rowing after joining a workout studio over 10 years ago after having my first kiddo. And I write about it in my book, Values First, about how sometimes something you didn't even need or even know about finds you and then you do need it. So listen to this chapter from Values First from the audiobook version which highlights where I talk about finding indoor rowing and even inspired the name for my company, The Catch Group. This story is from the life boundaries section of my values first framework. Let's take a listen. Life boundaries, building a boundary. Around here, the notion of boundaries isn't just some self-help fluff thrown around at a corporate retreat. In this section, I'm going to give you the tangible tools you need to not only set boundaries, but also keep them through grace and consistency. I've never considered myself an athlete. I casually played tennis in high school. I didn't take it too seriously. Sorry, fellow junior varsity tennis players from my high school days. A car accident that left me with a recurring back injury kept me from working out in my early 20s, or so I told myself. In my late 20s, I tried to run a few times with the Couch to 5K program. That led me to do my one and only 5K. I've never considered working out an enjoyable hobby. 
In my first pregnancy with my son, I ate for four. Potatoes were my biggest cravings. I had to have all the carbs, all of them. I gained 67 pounds in that pregnancy. Turns out he was only eight and a half pounds of that. Thank God my mother told me to pack my hospital bag with clothing to fit my pregnant body for coming home after the birth. She told me that she brought pre-pregnancy clothes with her when she had her first kid, my older sister, not realizing what state her body would be in after having a baby. Your post-birth body isn't like a balloon that flattens when the air gets let out. I ended up having a cesarean section, not the birth plan, but everyone was healthy. That meant more healing for me as we got to know each other, this new person they let us bring home. I focused on breastfeeding, which didn't come easily to baby and me, and taking care of myself and my incision. We slept when the baby slept. We supplemented with formula, a decision that was made between my husband and my mother out of desperation and exhaustion as I napped one day. It was the right decision for us. I had taken three months off for my maternity leave and wish I had taken more to be with him. By the time I went back to work, he was sleeping through the night for the most part, but we were all still exhausted. I was returning to a job that I had been at for a while, so it was good coming back to something I knew so well. When I came back, it was familiar but different. My priorities had shifted. I knew that this family was now the most important thing as I cried on the commute to the office on my first day back. Preparing to come back to work was also hard because I didn't fit into any of my clothes. My younger sister served as my stylist as we went shopping for work basics and nursing-friendly tops because I'd be pumping at work. I wore maternity pants well into post-baby life because they fit better than regular work pants. Going back to pants with zippers or buttons after wearing stretchy, elastic-waisted pants is a new circle of hell. The few pairs of pants that I did wear with the torturous combination of zipper and button, I unbuttoned as soon as I got into my car. It messed with my confidence, but I had a healthy baby, so it was okay, I told myself. Really, I felt like I'd lost myself and my body somewhere along the way. On my way home from work, I routinely passed a shopping complex with a new storefront. I saw women periodically going in and out of it, and I realized it was most likely a workout studio. It felt like something I should check out, like it was time to start focusing on losing the baby weight that I hadn't lost yet, eight months post-pregnancy. As you read this, you might be screaming, Ugh, why is that your motivation? To lose weight? What started as a motivation to lose weight, fueled most likely by the unattainable expectations that a patriarchal society puts on women to bounce back immediately after having a baby, eventually became a way for me to live out my value of balance. I got the courage to ask my good friend, Haley, if she would try out this new studio with me. Haley is notoriously up for a bargain, and there was a sign-up special for half off your first class. The studio taught low-impact, high-intensity workouts, including spin, indoor rowing, and ballet bar classes. I convinced her we could handle a bar class, a program with ballet moves. I took ballet as a kid. How hard could it really be? I was already in pain when the instructor mentioned we were only 10 minutes into the 60-minute class. What? How can that be? We've been here forever, eternally forever. During the bar class, I legit thought my legs would burn out and that I wouldn't be able to walk the 20 feet to my car. I kept thinking about how wonderful it would be to make it through the end of the class so Haley and I could talk about how we were never, ever coming back in one million years. I couldn't wait to talk about the ridiculousness of it all. What were we thinking? Somehow I got through the class and did walk out of the doors using my own legs. As I got to my car, I remember thinking that this was the last time I was going to be in this building ever. Just as I opened my car door, Haley looked at me and said, Well, that was horrible. When are we doing it again? Wait, what? You want to go back? I questioned, wondering if my friend had lost her mind. Yes, we are going back, she said with a smile. Ugh, fine, I conceded. I'll try it one more time. Nothing like peer pressure to help you make good life decisions. 
Two days later, I could barely walk. My legs burned. It hurt to sit down. It hurt to stand up. That made going to the bathroom painful and ridiculous. But I did not die. So we went back. We took more bar classes, and then I got the courage to try an indoor rowing class. It was like a spin class, but instead of a room full of stationary bikes, it was full of indoor rowers. I'd never seen a rowing machine before, besides glancing at a dusty old one in one of those big anonymous gyms that I paid a monthly fee for but never used. The indoor rower had a tank full of water at the top of it, with a thing that spun around the tank as you rowed. A big whoosh sound could be heard as you pushed back. As everyone jumped on their rowers and strapped their feet into the foot stretchers, there were whoosh sounds at different cadences across the room. Our instructor Molly, who reliably had a short bob, smile, and the best 90s and early 2000s hip-hop music playing, spent the first few minutes teaching us some terminology and told us to start rowing, even if we didn't know what we were doing. I started and felt like an awkward duckling. Start in the catch at the front of the machine, where you are almost tucked in a ball, but sitting straight up with your arms out. Holding onto the handles, your knees into your chest. Hold on, not too tight, with your pinkies slightly off the handles. Now push back, legs straight out, keeping your arms straight too. Then tip back, pretend your torso is a clock, and you are at 12 right now. Lean back into the 10 position on the clock. Then bring your arms to your sternum, right below the band of your sports bra. Then bring your arms back straight out. Keep your legs straight. Come back up to the 2 position on the clock, where your arms are now over your knees. Then slide back into the catch. You've just done a stroke, Molly explained as she did the motions with us. Like all of those words made sense to my brain. Eventually, I got it, though. Push off with your legs. Lean back with your core. Bring in your arms. Bring your arms back out. Back up with your core. Legs back in. Legs, core, arms. Arms, core, legs. One stroke. Legs, core, arms. Arms, core, legs. Two strokes. And there I was rowing. In the class, there are two sets of five rowers facing each other. Molly explained that even though we were on individual rowers, we would row together as if we were in the same metaphorical boat. So, let's get in sync together. If we don't, then the boat will tip and we'll be in the water, she said. Where was my metaphorical life vest for this? The thing about water rowers is that you can't outgrow them. So newbies like me or seasoned rowers were in these classes all together at different skill levels. I was the newbie in this class, but could see others around me that knew what they were doing. I wanted to get better at this. My value of achievement started seeping through. Rowing is the same motion over and over. The repetitive nature of it is mind-numbingly boring to some. For others, it is peace. Every time I get to the catch, just before you push off each stroke, I get a chance to start over, to burst, to push. That's a magical place, the catch. It is where your power comes from, just before an explosion of energy to keep you going, then a small pause before you do it all again. Getting to the catch is giving yourself another chance to try again, to explode off the platform with the force of your whole body, your whole self. My legs burned as I slid backwards on the rail. With the push and pull back and forth, I found my rhythm. My mind stayed in the present. I was focused. I was out of my own head. For the first time, I felt connected to something that I really liked in a workout. I'd never experienced that before. I'd always equated working out to something negative, as a punishment for eating too much or an excuse to eat more. Rowing felt like it was mine. Sometimes you plan for a boundary, and sometimes it finds you. Rowing found me through my value of balance. Without realizing it, I had filled the gap of balance that I needed in my life. I value balance, time for myself, for just me. As I look back, I built it by listening to what I needed at the time. Time for myself for a workout class, my value of balance. Then I built a boundary around it. 
I started taking multiple rowing classes a week at the studio. With my husband's support or with childcare when he was traveling for work, I prioritized working out at least three times a week. The community there was mostly women of different ages and different skill levels. I signed up for workout challenges and met new people. We were really a community. After several months, I had gotten stronger and more importantly, found something that I loved to do to move my body. I felt more comfortable in my own skin than ever before. It became a place where I didn't have to be anyone else but me, for me. I didn't have to be mom or a wife. Just Laura. For 45 minutes to an hour several days a week. A me I didn't even know was in there. I learned that I needed to prioritize my value of balance. I made it a priority and built a boundary to keep that time for myself. I needed to give myself space for me to relieve stress. In their book, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle, Emily Nagoski and Amelia Nagoski described emotion as a tunnel that you have to move through. Dealing with the stressors or the stress isn't enough. You must complete the cycle. Physical movement is one way to do that. The other ways to complete the cycle are through positive social interaction, laughter, affection, a big old cry, or through creative expression. What can you do? If I'm not balanced, something is off. I now include long walks in this category of finding balance and completing the cycle. I think about it as moving my body. Have I moved my body enough? Am I making progress and clearing my head each week? Not surprisingly, the weeks that I don't prioritize it, those weeks I'm more stressed. I'm not as calm. I have a shorter fuse. The weeks that I do prioritize it, I'm a more patient mom. I'm a more fun person. I feel more accomplished because I've kept that promise to myself. Balance isn't about work-life balance. Balance is ensuring that I've lived a week in balance with what I need. Balance is giving myself time and space for myself and having a support system that cares about me enough for that space to be prioritized. Not a balance beam, a teeter-totter. It isn't about staying on or off the balance beam. It is getting the right needs met in a week. Some weeks are higher, some are lower, but overall, if I'm keeping my boundaries, I feel balanced. I have tried to meditate so many times, and what runs through my mind is, I am in my head too much to do this effectively. I'm really bad at it. I cannot stop my mind from wandering. I'm not good at this. I'm not the kind of person who can do this. I'm in my head all the time as an introvert. Shouldn't this be easier for me? Or is it because I'm always in my head, it is harder to clear out my thought-filled mind? One of my I'm living my values when definitions for balance is to set my own pace. Rowing is the closest I've ever gotten to that peace and calm that others tell me come from mindfulness. Rowing is my meditation. Rowing is my place to get so many of my values met that it became a symbol for me. So much so that I named my company The Catch Group. And in that name, I get a constant reminder to carve out time for my values and myself as I build and grow my business. So now that you have the backstory of how I found indoor rowing and why my company is called The Catch Group, I wanted to give you the five lessons I've learned so far from my journey of my on the water rowing. So lesson number one, do a thing you want to do, even if it takes you more than five years to do it. So I remember I started my C-suite job in 2018. And in one meeting with my team, we had an icebreaker, you know, one of those things that everybody goes around the room and answers the same question. Um, And I answered the following question, what's one thing you've wanted to do, but haven't done yet. So at the time I was finishing my new year's resolution of rowing, 1 million meters in my uh, indoor rowing machine, which I did end up completing in mid-December of that year. That goal was all about consistency and racking up the meters with each workout. But that's not how I answered the question. So this was the question again. What's one thing you've wanted to do but haven't yet? And I had been thinking about this for a while. And this is what I answered. I've wanted to try rowing on a real boat out on the actual water. So that's how I answered that question. So I said it out loud in 2018 
And in that year, I traveled so much. I got a uh, chronic back pain. It flared up so much that I needed to um, be in physical therapy for many, many months. I had to stop rowing, which was not fun. And then eventually in 2019, it led to back surgery. So needless to say, I did not get out on the water that year or the year after. I did the research, though. When I was ready, I figured out how I could do it logistically. There's a rowing club not far from my house on a lake, and they have lessons for adults who want to learn. So in the back of my mind, when I was physically able to do it, I knew that I could. But I didn't. And time passed, even though I was healthy. Then the pandemic hit. And while you know, everything was put on hold for a lot of things. And I, you know, put that on hold as well. So one summer, I even emailed them to see when lessons started. But the timing wasn't going to work out. So again, I put it on the back burner. Then in my podcast in 2022, interviewing Amanda Knox, she asked me a question that put it in the front of my mind again. Here's a clip from episode 88, Belonging and Advocacy with Amanda Knox. I asked her, how do you prioritize yourself? Listen to this part of our conversation. You mentioned priority of um, daughter. You mentioned priority of husband. And then you also did mention your um, priority for meditation. What other things are just for you? How do you prioritize yourself? Well, I need to make this more of a priority because it was my go-to like happy thing that I did. I really enjoy crafting. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a huge nerd and I love like costumes and stuff like that. So for instance, um, one of the things that we want to do for Halloween is we're going to throw an Alice in Wonderland party and we are not just like creating our costumes, but you know, we're making giant paper mache mushrooms and we're like, we're, we're big nerds. And we like, we <laughs> like to like create things with our hands because we spend a lot of our intellectual time and our work time just in this intellectual product arena. Right. So making things with our hands um, is something that both my husband and I really enjoy but we haven't had as much time to do that with, with baby. So. Right. Right. I love that you're a self-professed nerd. I think all of us are in something. And if you're not, then you might be lying to yourself. <laughs> yeah. What, what's your thing? I like to do indoor rowing. That's sort of oh. random. <laughs> nope. Yeah. So I do that. I've never rowed an actual boat, not on the water ever. Never. Really? No, no, huh. not ever. It's on my list. Um, there's, there's a lake. I am, I'm in Dallas. I'm kind of landlocked, but there are some lakes around here. So, um, so that's on my list at some point to actually do it, to be cool. honest, I'm afraid that I'm going to hate it. <laughs> and so I, I kind of, I've been putting it off because I have the, I've romanticized it so much. Um, but that's actually where I find like my meditation, like my head is so clear when I'm rowing on my water rower inside. Um, and the repetitive motion is like, I can just like get lost. And I'm just thinking about how to make the next stroke the best one. Right. And so, yeah. so it's, um, that's kind of where my, my meditation lives. So after recording that episode, it kind of just put it back in the front of my mind again. And so I would love to tell you that after that episode, I signed up for rowing, but alas, it was about another six months before I went out on the water. I was on the email list from the last time I had inquired about rowing lessons and an email came out saying that they're having um, rowing lessons in the next couple of weeks. And this time the sessions worked out for my schedule because it was in the summer. So I tried my best to find somebody to go with me. I emailed several of my indoor rowing friends, but either they had summer plans that would conflict with it, or they didn't have the same urge as me to get out on the water. Some of them just didn't see my email. So I did a thing I almost never do. I signed up and I went all by myself. Yes, all by myself. If I do a new thing, I like to try and bring a friend if I can. Remember, I'm an introvert, so if I go by myself, then I have to talk to people. 
by myself. And I don't love that. I don't hate it per se, but it just, it's another added layer of anxiety that I sometimes have. That's just, that's a lot sometimes to deal with the newness of the thing, plus the being there by myself anyway, but I did it by myself. So I went to the boathouse while it was still dark outside, because when do you row in in the morning before the sun comes up y'all and guess what happened? Of course, everyone was nice and inviting. And after several times, I even made some new rowing friends, men and women who had an interest just like me, some who had rowed in college over 20 years ago and who wanted to get back into it. Others like me who had never rowed on a boat at all ever. Some whose kids had rowed, but they'd never done it before. And it's actually really interesting to me. These were my rowing friends. But I had literally no idea of what they did for a living for months. And they didn't know what I do either. I I didn't even realize just how many people I've met because of work. And we talk about work things that I, I never even asked my rowing friends what they did because we had lots of other stuff to talk about. But not surprisingly, these new friends are very accomplished lawyers, doctors, executives, or retirees. It feels like high achievers always have a way of finding each other somewhere. I'm guessing that in running clubs or other things like that, the same things happen, but that had never happened to me before like this. So the lesson here is for lesson number one, do a thing you want to do, even if it takes you more than five years to do it. Now for lesson two, the thing you think will help you be good at something may actually be holding you back. So the thing that you think will help you be good at it may actually be holding you back at being good at it. So I mentioned I'd never rowed on the water, but I had 10 years of indoor rowing experience. I had been told by experienced rowers in my indoor rowing class that I would be a really great rower on the water. I just knew I would be because I'm pretty good at indoor rowing on rowing machines. And this was like a fact that I had in my head. I just knew I, because I had this quote unquote experience. Because indoor rowing is totally like rowing on the water, right? Do you hear the sarcasm in my voice? It is not the same. (laughs) The simulation is not like the real thing, folks. Well, at least not in the beginning. When you get better and you are rowing at higher pressure, it does feel similar. But at the beginning, it is not the same at all. So the thing that I thought would be helpful actually put me at a disadvantage. So let me explain. I had been indoor rowing with the same form for 10 years, and that is a lot of muscle memory. Guess what? The wrong muscle memory to repeat. I'd overcorrected my rowing form by overextending my arms at the catch and leaning back too far after the push. So on the water, the form isn't that exaggerated. And I had to unlearn this move I'd done over and over and over for 10 years. And guess what? I keep making the same mistakes because of that muscle memory. So my friends, the thing that I thought would help me actually put me at a disadvantage for learning. It would actually have been better for me to have never stepped foot on a rowing machine. I will say that because of my unwavering confidence of indoor rowing, that led me and gave me the confidence to try rowing on the water. Without that misplaced confidence, I would most likely not have had interest in it at all or even signed up. But still, the 10 years of simulated rowing didn't really help me. This lesson could be translated into so many things in leadership. The place I see it most is when leaders become managers for the first time. The thing that got them promoted, you know, their knowledge of being good at something, their really great results for that thing. It doesn't help them when they get promoted to being a manager because they're managing others. They're doing lots of other things. So Marshall Goldsmith said it right. What got you here won't get you there. So that's lesson two. The thing that will that you think will help you be good at something else may be holding you back from being good at it. On to lesson three. I have found a hidden gift of being present. So earlier this year, I talked about needing to set a boundary to lessen the time I'm on my phone to be more present and not to do so much escapism scrolling at the end of the day. The key for me was to be more present. 
at night. I know that if I read instead of go on my phone, I'm much more present. Also, I have a better nighttime routine to get into bed earlier to get more sleep, which is great. I've been getting better at it, but it's still something I need to continue to work at this idea of, of being present. But you know what gets you in bed early? For me, knowing that I have to wake up early, this is another benefit of rowing because you row early in the morning and on days that we are out on the water, I need to get up at 5 a.m. That may not be early to some of you, but I am not a morning person. So that is early for me. But the good news is that on those nights before rowing, I am in bed by 10 for sure, if not earlier. What I hadn't realized about being on the water was that it was going to test my ability to be present. So when you row, your hands are literally holding onto the oars. When you're out on a boat, you are out and you just can't leave when you want unless everybody else wants to go back too. You are committed and you are fully present because that's your job to pay attention to all the stuff. I hadn't realized how amazing that part of being on the water was going to be. So no headphones no podcasts in my ear, no background noise, just looking in front of me and around me at the water, paying attention to the person in front of me to ensure that I kept my stroke consistent with theirs. You have to pay attention. So you are fully present. And when you take a break, you can look at the beauty of the water and the sunrise around you. It's just so very in the moment. I don't even have my phone or keys with me. Everything is left at the boathouse under lock and key. So you don't have to worry about any of your stuff. You just get to be in the boat and row. I love that unexpected benefit of rowing. This lesson number three of the fact that you have to be present is just such a gift. Now for lesson four, stop correcting yourself when you are doing the thing. Stop correcting yourself when you are doing the thing. So I am not really great at rowing yet. And that is hard for me. The fact that I'm not great at it yet. I am pretty, remember, I'm pretty good at indoor rowing, but this whole rowing outside with other people is way harder than I thought. And I am still learning and uncomfortable. And I question myself all the time. And in one recent lesson, my coach said, Laura, you are trying to correct yourself in the moment and it's messing up your stroke. Instead, you need to commit to the stroke you get another chance with every stroke. So this was in a lesson when I was in a solo boat. So by myself, so I was, I was rowing and then I forgot like a small thing. So I tried to correct it in the moment. And when you're by yourself, you can do that. But when you are in a boat with other people, you cannot do that. You will miss the stroke. You could get hit by the oar. So many bad things can happen anyway. So In the moment I was trying to correct myself and I told him, you know what? You are really more of a life coach than you are a rowing coach because in that statement, you know, it could help me in like so many aspects of my life. I'm always trying to do something perfectly. I am. And if I don't, I catch myself and then I overthink it and then I redo it and then I try and do it perfectly again. And so I'm still thinking through all the ways this coaching is helping me, this idea of Uh, an insight of trying to correct myself in the moment. So it definitely goes way beyond just rowing. So I'm sure I'll be back with you more on this one. It's definitely tied to people pleasing and perfectionism and all that kind of stuff. But until then, I'm really, instead of trying to be perfect and correcting in the moment, I'm trying to commit to the stroke. So committing to the stroke is what I have in my head instead. So instead I'm asking myself, what would happen if I committed to it, good or bad? I get another try. That's the benefit and the beauty of rowing. The next stroke is literally the next one. Like you have another chance in just a second. So what would happen if you tried something all the way without correcting yourself? There's a freedom in it, that freedom in doing it imperfectly. Now my last lesson, lesson number five, the benefits of not going it alone and being a part of a team. So when I first learned to row outside, we went out in an eight boat. That's eight rowers and you row sweep. So each rower has one big oar. There's four oars on the right side, which is the port side and four on the starboard side, which is the left. And it's um, right, left, right, left, all the way to eight, right? So the first time we went out in the water, 
we went on that eight boat. It's easier and more forgiving to learn on a boat with more people, right? So the first time we went out, the coach, the, the coach, you know, got us out on the water. We started rowing a couple of people at a time. They have a method that they teach you. You're hardly ever, like at, at the beginning, you're never rowing at the same time. Um, so you do different pairs or the front of the boat or the back of the boat at the same time. And the coach even mentioned that he saw a dead fish float by us. We were going so slow, but the whole point was we were going slow on purpose because we were learning. And so we had a chuckle about that. But after several weeks, we progressed getting out on the lake, staying less close to the dock. So if you know anything about rowing, you know that even in an eight person boat, there are nine people because of the coxswain. The coxswain navigates and steers the boat. So they verbally tell you what to do. They usually use a megaphone. They call out the orders to the rowers because it it is hard to hear out there. So they need that megaphone. They navigate and call out the moves, tell um, which people to row and when and why, how fast you're going, all that kind of stuff. However, one day out in the water, we had seven rowers and not eight. So one person was sitting as the coxswain, but we still usually in an eight person boat, I thought you have to have eight people, right? So can you still row with a rower missing? I found out that in fact you can, but it is harder. So we moved things around before I had been in a different rowing position in a different part of the boat. This time I was in seat two rowing port instead of starboard. So basically that's rowing on the opposite side of the boat that I had been learning in. And, um, number the number three seat sat empty. So you still can row a boat and that's usually the, the an eight boat. That's usually the seat that sits empty when they, when you do it. But it's very similar to when somebody is missing at work. So when somebody is missing in a team at work, some of the same behaviors emerge. You need to reassign the work. You will have to have new expectations, right? You will most definitely still feel the empty seat. You can, you can feel sometimes it going one way versus the other. It's not going in a, in a straight line, right? The team has to work differently together and that result still most likely won't be the same outcomes in the end. And the leader has to set really clear expectations. So the day that we went out in that boat, you know, different people were rowing together at different, different combinations because that three seat sat empty. Um, we had to navigate in a little bit of a different way, right? Because one side didn't have the same as many oars as the other, And the biggest lesson for me on this day was that you can still get the boat out on the water, even with one person missing, but the boat weighs more when you carry it out and back from that boathouse, because there's one less person carrying it and supporting it. And as a leader, the same is true for work when somebody is missing. So I want you to think about how are you supporting your team when they're in transition, when someone gets promoted or when someone needs more support? The work still gets done, but it's heavier on everyone doing that work. The other thing about rowing as a team is it sometimes takes this individual work and growth to benefit the entire team. So I mentioned I'm also taking a few solo lessons so that I can get better as a rower in general. That way, I'll also be better when I'm in a boat with the team. So when you row a boat or in a single, that's what that's called sculling. So you can scull in a single in a double or in a quad. So one person in a boat, two people in a boat or four people in a boat. And in sculling, you have two oars for each rower. So I did this, uh, my first sculling solo, I had two oars and you're in the boat by yourself. And then a coach follows you in a separate boat that has a motor. So he's like just following you, explaining different things, kind of um, guiding you that way. So in my first solo lesson, (laughs) the first five minutes, I almost ran into a dock, but uh, I was really happy. I did not flip the boat, which is great. And in that solo lesson, I just got so much better as a rower and a lot better as a navigator of a boat, which made me a better team member. When I got into another boat later in that week, I went on a double with a rowing friend who was more experienced than me. And it made me better as a rower when I got back into another eight boat as well. Even though sculling has two oars and um, when you row sweep, you just have one oar. I realized all of that, that individual work 
really help the team as well. So just being a part of a team and understanding how you contribute to a team is one thing, but also the individual work that you do separately also benefits the team as well. And I think, again, that is such a lesson to learn within leadership as well. It's not just the teamwork. It's also your individual growth that then can help the team and benefit the team too. So here are my lessons so far in rowing out in the water. Lesson one, do a thing you want to do, even if it takes you more than five years to do it. Lesson two, the thing you think will help you be good at something may be holding you back from being good at it. Number three, realize the hidden gifts of being present. Lesson number four, stop correcting yourself while you are doing the thing. And lesson five, there's so much benefit of not going it alone and being a part of a team. Indoor rowing is where I found a boundary for myself, where I can live out my value of balance. Now I can do that with rowing on the water too. And I'm living my value of balance by being present and living my value of growth through learning a new thing and trying something new. And I hope you like this very real episode of me sharing my learning experience with you. I'd love to hear from you to understand how you are living your values or which lesson you resonated most with here. Remember, your leadership belongs here. You belong in the C-suite. I want to thank you so much for listening to the You Belong in the C-Suite podcast. If you are enjoying this content, please remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. By leaving a review, you are helping others find this content. We will be featuring five-star reviews on air in upcoming episodes. Editing and support for the podcast is done by S&E Podcast Management. To get more tips and tools to help you live a life guided by your values, go to thecatchgroup.com. Keep your boundaries and take care. Mm-hmm.